Friday morning at eight is just hard for everybody since we've gone online all the way. But we do have a lot of people here. So, um, hey everybody, I'm gonna introduce these guys just really quickly. Our guest speakers this morning are Derek Maurer and Michael Blades, and they're both from further southwest Missouri a little bit, and they have a little, some experience in the gaming industry. But I'm gonna shut off my video and let them kind of first introduce themselves. They have you guys' list of questions, so sure. they're gonna go through those however they want to. If you guys wanna ask each other or whatever you wanna do, both answer each one or however you wanna handle it. And then of course, we should have time for some more questions as things come up. You guys raise your hand, or I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you just turned on your mic and interrupted if you have a question or something. So just feel free to be casual like that, but I'll go ahead and stop my video and give it to them. Thanks guys. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, cool. So I guess I'll just I have the the question sheet open. Do you have them open to as well, Michael? Yeah. Cool. Um, so what's the hardest thing slash worst thing about getting into the industry? Um, you got to tell us yeah. about yourself first. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want a good full intro. Now I'm gonna. Move okay. It. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So yeah, as she said, my name is Derek. Um, I kind of got my actual development start with Miss Riley's high school class in Carthage, Missouri. Um, so that's kind of really what got me started and interested in development in, in general. I actually was interested prior to that, but taking her class is really what got my start. And uh, then at that point, it was just kind of like, I just went off on my own after completing her class and just started learning all this information that I could just by myself. Uh, and then my real reason that I wanted to get into development was because I really wanted to make an iPhone app. And so I bought a Mac and I started working on iPhone apps. And um, eventually I started working for Leggett and Platt, which you may have heard of. Uh, it's a pretty large company in Carthage. Um, and then went started going to Missouri Southern State University for school. And uh, that all went well. And eventually I got an internship at Apple. And so I stopped school for a semester and went out to work for Apple for a little while and then came back and continued working and finishing out my degree. Uh, and then at that point, uh, I had met uh, one of the Jonas brothers through Twitter actually, and uh, started communicating with him and developing apps for him. Uh, and then eventually it kind of developed into like this full-time development uh, situation. And uh, at that point, uh, he had joined another company called the Blue Market and as like their, I guess, co-CEO or whatever. And he brought me along with them and I started working with them and I built out a team here in Joplin. And Michael was on that team as well as a few other developers. And we basically just built mobile games. Uh, we don't have a ton of experience in Unity. You know, it's something that I know both Michael and I have kind of picked up a little bit. Um, you know, Michael probably more than me, but um, we mostly developed out in native languages for iOS. We didn't really do a whole lot of Android because there isn't a huge market for Android, um, or at least there wasn't at the time. The Android store is not the best. Um, so we mostly just did mobile, uh, or sorry, native iOS. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We did Sprite Kit and uh, what's the 3D one? I forget. Do you remember? Uh, scene kit. Yeah, scene kit. That was it. Yeah. So we did sprite kit and scene kit, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. It was a great little uh, SDK. Um. So yeah, our experience was essentially just building out mobile games and marketing them. So Blue Market was primarily a marketing and app marketing agency, and we were brought in as kind of like internal developers to make our own games inside of this agency and then develop, or sorry, then uh, promote them inside of the agency. And so we were able to have like some very successful games. One of our games was making a lot of money. Uh, at, at one given time, it was making, I think like 160K a month. And uh, it was pretty crazy, but yeah, anyway. So long story short, uh, the other guy, not Kevin Jonas, the other like founder of the company, I guess he just I don't know, got greedy and started taking too much money out of the company 
And eventually the company collapsed and Michael and I and the rest of the developers, we all kind of like went our own ways, unfortunately. And uh, I, at that point, I'll let Michael kind of, you know, tell his own story from that point. But uh, from that point, I started my own software development company. So developing out software for various brands and pretty much anything that people need, um, apps, websites, whatever. Um, so haven't been in the gaming industry specifically for a few years now, but, you know, I look back on it very fondly. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I definitely still want to get back into it at some point when I have some free time. Uh, it would be a lot of fun to make a Switch game, I think. So anyway, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now, just running my own software development company. Uh, I've got an office here in Joplin, and I've, right now I've got one full-time developer and looking for more people, actually. So if you guys know of anybody who uh, is looking for a development position doing websites and apps, let me know. So that's, that's pretty much it for me. So, uh, Michael, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like Derek said, we kind of got our start kind of the same way. Miss Riley's uh, high school tech classes. So, um, from there I worked at Freeman health system. It's a local hospital here in Joplin, um, worked there for a couple of years. And then my buddy was working with Derek at the time and he was telling me all about these crazy things. He's working with Kevin Jonas and making iPhone apps and games and, um, I was really interested in it at the time, and so I um, interviewed with Derek and uh, got accepted, and so I uh, worked with him for a couple of years and um, made, you know, games. A lot of them were pretty successful at the time, um, and then, like you said, you know, once that kind of collapsed, um, I ended up going back to Freeman, and now I'm now a, a system analyst for them, and I basically do full stack development on their um, internal ticketing system and stuff, so um that's kind of where i've been you know i've been out of it for a little while but yeah like derek said it's definitely something that i enjoyed and definitely if i ever got the chance i'd probably go back and do it so yeah i guess so does anybody have any questions before we get into the actual questions <laughs> all right cool I'll jump into the actual questions then. So what is the hardest slash worst thing about getting into the industry? Um, so for me, and I guess for both of us, we really worked on very much of an indie team. You know, we didn't work for like a AAA development company. Um, so I can't really speak to like how hard it would be to get into those companies per se, but um, you know, I can, I can only guess but I would imagine that the, you know, the hardest slash worst thing about getting into those companies would really just be experience. Um, I know that uh, having a degree and, or not having a degree, uh, but having more experience is becoming a lot more valuable for a lot of companies that are developing out games. Um, yeah, uh, Mike, what about you? Yeah, I would say pretty much the exact same thing. Um, having like a really, rounded github profile with a bunch of demos and stuff you could run off of that is definitely a good thing i would say so yeah i'd say that's probably what a lot of employers are looking for more than anything nowadays so for sure yeah a well-rounded linkedin profile as well um yeah. you know i guess for me in my hiring um i'll very much uh just kind of browse their linkedin profile more than more than i care about their resume or sometimes even necessarily even having an interview you know, the interview really tells me like uh, what kind of person they are, but you know, seeing their LinkedIn profile uh, is that first step before I want to kind of even start talking to that person. So having a well-rounded LinkedIn profile is definitely um, a good way to start getting into the industry. So, okay. So I guess if there's no questions on that one, then I'll move on to the next. Uh, what was the most difficult task when it came to building a successful game? So I'd say 100%, 100% was the marketing. So if you don't do the marketing well, I mean, you can have the best game in the world and just won't be seen by anybody. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of saturation in the market, uh, especially in the mobile games market, where like, I mean, you can like I said, you can develop the best game in the world. And sometimes people just will never even recognize that it exists. Uh, and so that's just kind of like the unfortunate reality. 
Um, so that's definitely the hardest part because, you know, if you're an indie team, uh, getting, getting funding for getting that marketing going is, is a difficult task. I mean, if you want to have an extremely successful app to the point like where our app was number one in the store, uh, you know, we were a part of a marketing agency, so they had the funding and the backing and the proper channels to kind of get us there. But, uh, you know, I mean, they had to spend at least 200 grand to get to the app to that point, even with all of their expertise. So it was uh, not an easy task for sure. Um, but I guess uh, the, the question was probably more related to code, I would imagine. So I guess when, for me, I think it was really tuning the physics. Um, the game that we were developing out before the, the whole company just kind of collapsed was a fun like a 2D puzzle game. And getting the physics exactly right was a little bit more of a difficult task. Uh, some of the collision boxes you know, were a little bit finicky, which unfortunately we never got to finish out. Um, but yeah, I'd say really tweaking the physics was probably one of our more difficult tasks. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, definitely physics, um, which that may be a place where Unity has um, iOS, you know, stepped up there because their whole physics engine. Um, another thing I would definitely say is figuring out what makes your game replayable. Because mm, if yeah. you can get their attention, they play it once and they're done, then you know they're not coming back. You're not getting that ad revenue, you're not getting anything. So definitely trying to figure out what makes your game want to keep people coming back to it. So for sure, yeah. Building on that, I guess I wouldn't say it's, that it's a hard thing, but it's an important thing is to yeah. add analytics to your game so that you can really kind of figure out at what point people are falling off so that you can understand why they're falling off so that you can redevelop your game. You know, you, you don't just develop a 1.0 of your game and put it out and it's just done. Like it's a very procedural process. Uh, you have to be continually updating it, understanding how people are using it, uh, understanding why people aren't using it and uh, continually making decisions to improve it and continually releasing versions. Definitely. Um, so let's see, when you entered the industry, did you fall into it naturally or did you feel like you had to push your way into it? Um, so I guess that kind of goes back to like my story. I had met Kevin over Twitter and so it was kind of like a natural thing. Um, it just, it just worked out, but I honestly don't know what the experience would be like for the typical person when trying to get into like, you know, like a, like a triple A type uh, game studio. Um, I think, I really don't think that you would have to force your way into it if you did have the things that, you know, Michael and I were talking about, a really well-rounded LinkedIn profile, a well-rounded GitHub profile. Those things, like I, I have recruiters emailing me every single day. Um, I ignore all of them, but <laughs> you know, like it's, it's not as hard to get into these companies as you might think if you have the experience that they're looking for. So understanding what they're looking for in, in you know, the proper experience, that's what gets you in. You won't have to force your way into anywhere if you have the proper experience. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. You got anything else to add? Um, no, not really. I mean, like I said, having the you know github you know if people are seeing stuff that you're putting out then you know they'll be reaching out to you you know you won't have to push too hard i don't think so. yeah yeah for sure can i ask a question um when you're talking Absolutely. about their, their github profile what i do you, would an employer be looking through source code or looking for you know like readme documentation that would show good stuff or what kind of things would you be kind of scavenging through a github profile? uh i Sure. Yeah. I know for me, I would definitely be looking at um, source code, uh, code organization. Um, that tells me a lot about um, how well they're going to work with teams. You know, if they're, if they're well organized, they're probably going to work with teams. If they're, I, I've seen a lot of very terrible, very unorganized code bases and like managing those code bases have been a complete nightmare. Um, so it's, it's, that's an important factor. Uh, for me as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, and documentation is another big one. Um, I wouldn't say documentation is 100% necessary. Um, 
but it's it's definitely helpful it it tells you a little bit about how that developer's mind works you know that they're they're already thinking about um another developer potentially reading this code and helping them understand it right and if it's like a game for example that you have on github um you know they're probably not going to necessarily clone your repo and install it and play it um but you know have a link in your readme to like a video or something on a youtube channel or you know just something that they can look at and see what the actual product looks at um just so they can kind of see that you actually did something and how it looks and yeah cool any other questions before we move on okay what kind of games influence do you become a game developer? Do they still influence the games that you make today? Well, like I said, you know, kind of our story, uh, neither of us are really in the game development world today. So unfortunately, you know, we aren't making games today. Uh, I wish we were, honestly, like it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, uh, so what kind of games influence do you become a game developer? Um, man, I, I, dude, I played everything. Um, <laughs> I guess mobile game, we, we were in the mobile game space. I don't play a ton of mobile games, um, you know, but I play, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, PC games and Switch games. Uh, Apex Legends is my, my favorite current game right now. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It definitely inspires me to, uh, I, I think my favorite character is Pathfinder, if we have any Apex players in the call, but, uh, so like his, the way that they have built his physics into the full engine has been really cool. And it's, it's definitely inspired me to kind of get back into it and, and work with physics engines again. Uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like Apex Legends. Uh, probably my favorite game is uh, Path of Exile. I have played that so many times, um, but something that I always kind of keep in mind or kept in mind when I was developing is the game Space Invaders because the aliens and stuff weren't meant to speed up in that game, and it was originally just because the more aliens you kill, um, it was able to render faster. So I always kind of kept that in mind. You know, it's like it may not be what you intended, but you know, roll with it, and that ended up being up what made Space Invaders so fun was because it sped up. So cool. Yeah, I've never even heard of Path of Exile. Looks like it's a Steam game. Yeah, it's a MMORPG. So. Cool. Cool. Let's see. Super important. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, cool. When uh, making a game, how much time goes into planning versus actually making the game? So that's actually a really good question because uh, a lot of times we would kind of just get into we'd have an idea and we just kind of get into like that development mode like oh we, let, let's make it you know um i'd say it just really depends on your development process um we kind of worked in the way where like we would have an idea and we'd start to work on it and then be like oh well like we need to add this or maybe this would be better and it really kind of helped us understand um like what the game was going to be a lot better um, I will say though, you know, as like a project manager at this point now, um, somebody who is thinking about, uh, I, this may not interest a lot of people, uh, game developers, but, you know, being a project manager and thinking about like, you know, the bottom line, making sure a project is, you know, on track to completion date um, and how much money it's taking to build it. Uh, you know, planning is insanely important uh, before any development starts. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely changed the way I develop now where like, there's a ton of planning leading up to it. Like to the point where you're like, like, I've thought about this a million times. There literally can't be one more thing I can think about. Um, and then at that point it's like, okay, let's start development and let's get going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It is boring, but it is definitely important. That is for sure. Yeah, definitely. Whenever they come up with new features, um, I go to, you know, 10 meetings before I even start touching anything because, you know, I may have thought about like, oh, okay, I'm ready for everything. And then all of a sudden a project manager will tell me like, oh, did you think about this? I'm like, I didn't even think that way. And it, you know, I was going to push back yeah. the timeline a week or so. And it's just like, it, you know, you got to think of everything. And 
you got to make sure that you have a you know a really good plan before you even start because then if you get all the way through your development and then you think something comes up and you got to change it all again then you did all that work for nothing so for sure yeah collaboration is really important in that in that time as well um you know you can sit here and think about uh one thing uh, 10,000 times uh and think that you understand it in every way you could possibly think but the, as soon as you present it to somebody else they're like oh what about this and you're like I'm such an idiot. Why did I not think of that? You know, like collaboration is very important uh, during the whole process, but uh, definitely at that point. Um, cool. Let's see. So how well did you feel you were prepared for interviews? Honestly, I've never really felt prepared for an interview. You know, I just, <laughs> I don't think anybody yeah. ever really does. You know, there's always going to be nerves going into an interview. Um, but I think, being prepared for an interview has a lot to do with just, you know, your experience. Um, go check out the company that you're applying for. Look, look and see what they're doing. Look and see what technologies that they're doing. Uh, if they're, if they're using a technology that you have no experience in or that the job doesn't, uh, or yeah, if the job says that it needs a task or a, an experience in something, uh, go brush up on that. Um, you know, even if it's just basics, um, do uh, use your time as best as you can to understand it, you know, even, even if it's just very minimally. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, when I was walking in my interview for, um, the blue market with Derek, I had no idea what I was logging into because I didn't really know anything about anything because there wasn't really anything online for it. So it was definitely a <laughs> different experience, but, um, for sure, yeah. You know, you just gotta kind of go in with an open mind, and you know, just roll with how the interview's going. And so, yeah, for sure. Okay. Do you feel it's necessary to have a bachelor's degree, um, Mr. Riley? Don't hate me, but no. <laughs> um, just being honest, I I don't. And the the reality is that. Uh, okay, she's giving me the thumbs up. <laughs> Um, reality is a lot of game studios these days, they, they don't care. Um, they look, they're looking for experience and I'm, I'm the same way. Um, I, I'm looking for experience as well. Uh, you know, if they have a, a degree, that's great. You know, I know that they're uh, already a fairly well-rounded, uh, developer. Um, but experience is definitely key. Yeah, I agree yep for this kind of stuff you don't necessarily need a degree but you know it will give you a leg up necessarily but so yeah for sure i know as well i very much look fondly back on my time with miss riley in my high school courses because it really did get my start you know i was at the point where i didn't really know how to start but then once she got me started i kind of just like did everything on my own um, I very much look back at my college experience as kind of like, um, I wouldn't say a waste of time or money, but like definitely n I, I don't use it today. Um, I very much use all of my general education. Um, I, I, I definitely found that to be helpful in my, in my just, I guess how well-rounded I was, but as far as like my actual development courses, at least the school that I went to, um, and Michael went to the same school as well. But the school I went to, you know, they were very behind on all the technologies that they were using. So, um, you know, I very much felt like I already knew most of the stuff that they were teaching. Um, but I was, I was probably, we we're both of us were probably exceptions, you know. Um, we were people that were learning out on our own and who already knew the stuff that they were teaching before they taught it. So, yeah, that was, that was my experience. Yeah, I kind of the same experience i mean it's good to you know go and have the experience you know kind of if you're if you haven't really had any development experience you know definitely college will get you the experience of that but yeah. um if you're doing stuff on your own and you have a good portfolio i'm gonna you know, say it's you know not necessarily necessary to have a degree so yeah and and yeah i i definitely agree with that comment uh miss riley it, it it does become a part of you so yeah. it's really hard to kind of look back and kind of like understand because I mean, you, your memory is biased, you know, it's kind of hard to look back and really understand where you were at any given point and compare yourself to now and not really take full account of all the different influences in your life. I know I look back and 
Riley was a big influence on my life and my own efforts in my own education were a big influence. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, my education in college had a lot of influence as well. I just, you know, it probably just didn't make as big an impact. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Is there a lot of opportunity for remote work when it comes to the game industry? Well, right now, yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, as far as getting new work right now, that may be another story. I know uh, probably a lot of game studios are probably not doing a whole lot of hiring. Um, they probably aren't doing a whole lot of laying off, but um, yeah. So as far as remote work goes, like just generally software development, there's a ton of remote work. Um, but if you're wanting to work remotely for like a AAA, I honestly don't know. I would imagine that there still is, but probably less of it. Um, game development is a very collaborative uh, field of work. You know, it's, it's a lot of art. And if you aren't uh, communicating and around the other artists, then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult. But it, it's still possible, you know, uh, it's very much possible to still do game development remotely. Yep, definitely. The software industry is definitely more heavily on remote. Um, I was at the Springfield Dead Conference a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was a company there, and their whole company is all remote. And so it's mm -hmm. definitely, definitely popular. But like Derek said, you know, in the game industry, it's probably looking to more kind of office spaces and I think the companies kind of realize that and they kind of make their offices a little bit more enjoyable to be in than most. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. What are the skills that you hadn't necessarily thought you would needed before working in the industry that you had to hone afterwards? Um, I, I thought about this question leading up to the call and I couldn't really think of anything super great. Uh, I was kind of an empty slate when I when it came when I started development. I did wasn't really thinking of anything like, oh, I'm definitely not going to need that because um, I didn't really know what I would need and what I didn't. I know looking back though, something that I was kind of like unaware of that I was not taught. I had to learn myself uh, was using source control, Git, uh, stuff like that. Um, it I mean it was it's how much I use it on an everyday basis, it's like absolutely insane that it's not taught at my school. Uh, you know, Miss Riley, you may, you may teach it. You definitely should um, if you don't, but, or if they don't already know it from a different course, but um, not anymore. Oh, sorry. That was an old comment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Mike, what do you got to say? Uh, yeah, I definitely say Git. Git is super important to know, um, and I really wish Southern would teach it. <laughs> um, uh, something else that I would definitely say that I use probably more in mine than Derek's, um, but public speaking, that's very important, being able to communicate not only your ideas, but communicate with others on what they're trying to think, and so it's definitely an important thing that I would say. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree with that. You know, I, my industry is pretty different from, from Michael's. Um, you know, I mostly work with uh, communicating like with external clients. So I would definitely uh, consider that a high value uh, characteristic as well. Uh, you know, having to talk to uh, random companies and be able to eloquently explain um, everything that I, I would need to do in order to accomplish a task is, is kind of a difficult thing. You know, when you're talking to non-tech people, um, I deal with some pretty pretty uh, dumb people when it comes to tech. So it's, yeah, it's a difficult task to hone. So I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, definitely. Like when I was at Prima before, I was just a desktop support specialist. So I was just dealing with, you know, regular users working on their computers. But now that I'm a, a systems analyst, you know, I have to walk into meetings with a bunch of C-suite level people. And it's just, you know, you got to be able to, you know, hold your ground and present yourself well in front of all of them. Sure. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see, how much did you feel you had influence on the final project? Like, does it become a, like your personal touch is there, or was it just assistance? I've been a bit leery and working teams because of this. Um, so I know with our team, you know, we we're very much like an indie team. We were a small, small company. Uh, it was like everybody had a say in, in what was going on. Um, it working in, in that type of environment was just, it was awesome. Like 
everybody was like, oh, this would be a cool idea to add. And we'd be like, um, well, yeah, let's think about this some more or be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that. Um, you know, I, I very much believe in that type of, uh, functioning company. Um, you know, eventually you have to have a hierarchy because at some point somebody has got to make a decision, uh, about what to do. Um, that's just how it has to be, but it, you know, having the ability to have every single person have a say in or at least present their ideas at the very least um is an amazing thing that in the long run will make your product better um so that's very much how we operated as a company and you know i like i said i haven't worked for a triple a company before so i don't i don't know how a lot of them operate uh, i said i was a fan of apex so i've kind of watched videos of the developers i follow a few of the developers on twitter and i very much get that uh perception of how they work they definitely seems like a lot of the the employees there very much have i mean it would be less of a say obviously because it's a gigantic game that affects millions of people um you know but if somebody has a good idea like people are going to listen to it um i'd yeah. say working with a team is a incredibly important ability to have because yeah. I mean, if, if you're working by yourself for the rest of your life, it's, it's possible, but you're not going to make it super far. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Most everything nowadays, I feel like is, you know, team-based and it's really good to get everyone's input because, you know, something that you think may be incredibly fun, you know, could be, you know, very boring to someone else. So, and there's always going to be places and times, you know, that you're going to be able to add, you know, your kind of own little personal touches but um there's definitely a time and a place for that so. yeah um did i skip the question that says uh when making a game how much time versus planning goes into it or did we talk about that <laughs> i don't remember i think you said that one okay okay cool okay uh are there any other questions Um, so as far as like LinkedIn profile, you know, having a good picture is important. Um, mostly like all the development languages that they, uh, that they have experience in link to the projects that you have on GitHub, as far as GitHub, um, commit or, uh, uh collaborate on projects, uh, go out to open source projects that you know of and collaborate on them you know create some pull requests and see if you can get them approved um, or at the very least uh push your push your code that you're working on for miss riley's class up there um you know you can you can put anything you want up there so having a well-rounded github profile with different languages well-documented code well-formatted code uh, is is very important add add readmes um because that will also make you look more professional as well for sure, definitely agree with that. And uh, you can even, if uh, if you're interested in making like a website portfolio, I mean, GitHub can even host that for you too. So if you you know wanted to demo your product there, you know you can even host that on GitHub. So for sure. Any other questions? Alex, didn't you have some questions about your game? Is he there? <laughs> I think that's it. Look, we've had some people show up since you guys are about here. Oh, questions. <laughs> I know there's internet issues around yes, about around town, so it is. I got you. Let's see. Is Andrew still at LinkedIn? Uh, talking about Andrew that I went to school with. Yep. Uh, he's at Yelp. Yelp. Yep. That's, that's where it was. Every once in a while I get those weird Yelp invites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he had actually, that's another good example of uh, making some pull requests on GitHub. He had actually um, made some pull requests to their um, public repos and in his interview they actually mentioned that, that he had made some of those. So it's definitely a good uh, conversation was, starters when like you can he, see that those are... He had pulled code to look at their code and they no uh, he had made some changes, like he had fixed um, like, like a couple of small issues. And, oh, oh. And they even mentioned that yeah, in his interview, so.
Okay, guys, let's ask him some more questions while we've got them, and uh, then we'll let him get to work today. But let's think yeah. about all of these things that you're thinking of. Let's ask him. Yeah, level design, that's a, that's a hard one, honestly. That was a task that I kind of assigned to Michael, so he may have more to speak on it than me, but I, I definitely found that difficult. Uh, it involved lots of play testing. Um, just kind of like understanding progression and difficulty. Uh, so, you know, you know, understanding like how, how uh, difficult it should become between levels one and 10. Um, yeah, it was, it, it just involved lots of testing. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, with level design, um, I don't have any like specific places on where it'd be good to learn it, but you know, just, yeah, like Derek said, a lot, a lot of play testing. Um, you know, I kind of think back to some of the other games that are, you know, similar to it. That's something that we did a lot was, you know, we download a game that, you know, is somewhat similar to what we're trying to make and kind of see how they kind of progress and how quickly, you know, things would go through. Um, Cause that's, you know, that's really what you got to do. You got to play it over and over again to make sure it's not mm -hmm. progressing too fast or too slow and kind of make sure that the replayability is going to be there. Or they're not going to immediately get too hard and just throw your phone into the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what core languages would you recommend? Um, you know, you guys are already doing it. C Sharp. It's used like everywhere. Um, it's a it's a very well rounded language for sure. Um, if you want to stick to game development, then uh, you know probably stick to C Sharp. Uh, it's used. I mean, in almost every um, different SDK. Uh, but you know, if you want to be just like a rel one rel rounded developer in general, I'd pick up React, um, JavaScript, you know, I mean, by picking up React, you're picking up JavaScript, HTML, TypeScript, whatever. Um, but React is a really great language to, to pick up for sure, if you just want to be a really well-rounded well developer. Yeah, I would agree with, you know, C-sharp, JavaScript, all those, yeah. good, good to learn, yep. Any other questions? What about Java itself? Do you see it died, dead, gone, what? Java these days is like, I mean, it's used in lots of uh, like corporate systems, but it's uh, mostly like backend. I personally hate Java, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, if you, if you know the syntax of JavaScript, then the syntax is similar, but they're still very much different languages. Um, but I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to have experience in everything. But um, yeah, it's Java kind of sucks in my opinion. Yeah, I would say Java's definitely kind of going on the back end and things are kind of mm. moving away from it, so. Yeah. Chrome is dropping support for Java this year. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Everything is running Chromium now, so. <laughs> True. Yeah. And even Internet Explorer, well, Edge, I guess. They're switching yep. over to Chromium. And they should too. Their their uh rendering engine was garbage. Oh yeah. I guess Fire yep. Firefox is like the only thing, I think. What do you think are the best programming practices for building mechanics or any advice on building multiple mechanics and keeping them from breaking each other? Yeah, that was kind of like when I was talking about earlier, um, you know, the difficult task with physics that we were having, that's, that's kind of like the issue we were having was um, physics, the different physics boxes like interacting with each other in a very close space because uh, it was a puzzle game and we were using sprite kit to develop it so we were using physics to make this puzzle game um, and honestly it was like just lots of tweaking um, understanding why things weren't uh, functioning like the way we were imagining it to uh, using development tools to like see the different um, boundaries of a sprite it that was that was super helpful you know, cause like maybe you're like expecting like, like a perfect L for example, like I was saying, like it's a puzzle game we were working on. So maybe you're expecting your sprite to move in a perfect L, 
but it just happens to bump into the corner of another sprite. Having those boundary lines turned on was super helpful for us and really understanding like what the actual problem was. Yeah, definitely. So development tools, really, that's kind of like the answer, you know, using all the development tools that you have at your, uh, on your IDE. I don't really know what's on Unity. I would imagine a lot of stuff though, because pretty much everybody uses it. And since I've been teaching for a long time, one thing that kind of comes up to me is that it seems like students that work hard, that are willing to put in the time and effort, and that are excited by the opportunity to learn something new, seem to be the most successful. Mm, in absolutely. Future. And when you're looking at someone's LinkedIn profile or their GitHub profile, is that what you're really looking for behind the scenes? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, when I'm hiring people, the thing that I look for most is I, to be honest, like I don't really want to hire the people because I'm, I'm a very small company. So my, my hiring has got to be like super strict. I can't afford to take on a person who's just going to weigh down the team and also weigh down my bank account. Um, cause that doesn't get me anywhere as a company. Um, so the people that I really look for are the people who are doing stuff in their own time. The, the people who are very excited by what they're actually doing, uh, who are excited by technologies. Um, you know, there are, there's always going to people be people who go through college and they're just looking to get a development job because they heard it pays well. Um, and those people will be okay developers and they'll they'll be able to go get a job at a fortune 500 company and you know just kind of like blend into the mix but you know if you're wanting to i think be an exceptional developer and really get into a job like i think having that special interest that you know makes you so driven that you want to learn this stuff even when you don't have to be i think that's really the key factor Definitely, you know, putting in your own time, not necessarily just doing what you have to and kind of, you know, experimenting things on your own, not just doing what, you know, the job wants you to do. So, yeah, I'd say that definitely helps. What do you think the worst slash best work you've ever done on a game? Um, and I know we made a game for, for uh, Joe Jonas that sucked. Is it was not good. Uh, the timeline was kind of rushed on it, and the idea was just not there. And uh, we just tried to make it work, and it didn't work. Um, but yeah, I think what was the worst work you've ever done was probably that, um, just because like it was kind of a difficult task to do in the first place. Um, you know, we could have put a lot more work into it and made it a lot better. But uh, at that point, like they kind of just like abandoned the project. Um, the best work that we've ever done, I think was honestly that puzzle game that we were making before the whole company collapsed. Um, and we never got to finish it, but it was like, it was this close to being done. Yeah, and it was, it was cool. It was like cool. the artwork was amazing. Uh, we hired a guy out of Russia to do the artwork and the animations. And it was a lot of fun. It was like, I, like, like I said earlier, I don't play mobile games. Um, I don't personally find them to be, um, that I guess entertaining to me. I mean, like, yeah, sure. They're entertaining, but I guess if I have spare time to play a game, like I'm going to do it like on my PC or my switch or something. Um, but yeah, that game was a lot of fun. I think. Yep. I would agree. If that game would have went out I think that would have been our highest grossing game right there. I think so too. Yeah. 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 I mean, honestly, it, it just depends on the person. You know, I would, I know a lot of people who would very much disagree with what both of us are saying. Um, to say there, there's a, there's very much a market for it. Uh, I'm just not the target market. You know, understanding who the target market is, is incredibly important. Um, understanding, you know, why people want to play a game. That's incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, true. 
it uh, <laughs> it definitely did suck from uh, you know that good game never making it to market. It was very unfortunate. When you guys saw the games that were being successful that were bringing in so much money, um, did that impact your income? Not like, you know, I'm not asking like personally, sure. but I would think it would be hard to watch that successful of a game if it didn't affect yeah. your income at all. So that's- yeah, No, yeah, that's, uh, it's a good question. It's honestly why the company collapsed. Uh, the, it, and let me be clear, it was not Kevin. Kevin has always been, and I mean, not will always, I don't know, <laughs> but he's always been an awesome guy. Like he's been an absolute amazing person to work with, but it was the other guy who was a super greedy person. And, uh, you know, he basically just took all that money for himself. You know, we got, I know, uh, Michael and I got paid pretty well for Joplin, but you know, we were, we had a game that was making three and a half million dollars a year. So I don't, I don't think we saw the compensation that we should deserve for, the, for doing that, but you know, look, we still look back on the, or at least I still look back on the experience fondly, but you know, it would have been nice to have seen some financial appreciation for that as well. Yeah. There's a question here from Austin. Looks like, have we ever thought about finishing the game and posting it under a different market? Uh, if we could, we would, I think, but yeah. 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 Find, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We signed NDAs, so we can't, Right. Can't do that, but that would definitely would have been nice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That would have, it would have been kind of cool. Um, it, it wouldn't take long to finish either. I actually loaded it up on my phone not too long ago and it still ran the way I remembered it. It, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a little clunky, but just like, I don't know, like give it like 20 hours or so. And I think it would have been there. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately we can't do that. It's owned by, the company that uh, that employed us. Um, I'm a graphic designer. Knowing your yeah, yeah for sure. Um, let's see, I know my grandma has sunk 500 plus hours into Candy Crush on her iPhone. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, understanding your target audience is insanely important. You know. Yeah, like I said, I wasn't the target audience for my <laughs> the games that we developed, but you know, it, it was still a lot of fun developing them out. I had a love for the whole development ex experience, not just the actual product that I created. Um, it was the yeah, it, it was everything. Yeah. I always think, look at Farmville, you know, because I mean, you had the stupid little cows and vegetables kind of just moving around on the screen and people would build their farm up to the point where it disabled their computer you know their computer <laughs> couldn't load all those resources and they would go out and buy a bigger computer so that they could wow. keep their farm running we actually had um, that happen a lot I think when Michael was there when we tried to do a little PC repair shop one person brought in her husband's computer and said he couldn't do his farm work <laughs> and my student helper came in and said, he's playing Farmville and I'm not going to fix it. And I was like, no, he has to go on. He's, no, he was playing Farmville. So That's funny. Those, those stupid things can, people can invest a whole lot of money. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's honestly kind of crazy. Like the, the type of money those types of games can make. I was listening to a podcast just the other day where a kid made a, uh, a, uh, oh, dang it. What's the, What's the game where you like dig and uh, it's very blocky? Why am I forgetting the name of it? Minecraft? Minecraft, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I, I heard a podcast the other day where a kid created a Minecraft server and made two and a half million dollars off of it. So, I mean, I, I like a, <laughs> me not remembering the name tells everything about that story. Like I, I know nothing about Minecraft and I've never played it. So. Um, yeah, just, I guess, understanding your target audience is super well, is super important because, you know, a lot of people spend time on things that you wouldn't spend time on. Yeah. Time to make a Minecraft server. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't it, wasn't it Andrew that made a lot of money in high school off his Minecraft server? Or was uh, 
Yeah, it was. Yeah, he had one that he made. I know at least a couple thousand. So it was pretty good money for a, a yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a high school kid. Enough so that his parents got pretty upset when they realized what a hit they were going to take on their income taxes because they had to add that in. <laughs> Minecraft to the rescue. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? Yeah, it is. The Farmville is pretty old at this point. Then Minecraft's older. It might be. I don't know. Microsoft bought it, what, like five or so years ago? Uh, but it was pretty old at, at that least. point. At least. Yeah, I think yeah. it's fairly old now. Yeah. So it's amazing that people are still making money off Minecraft servers. So It's a lot of kids. My My nephews play it endlessly. Yeah, and like Alex says, that it's been improved consistently and the bottom line is at the very beginning it was very effective with its use of resources mm, so okay. it was um never you know super laggy that kind of stuff just well you know the way 8-bit graphics sure yeah yeah so it, it's just always been something that ran effectively oh yeah and a lot of stuff still runs on old java code so in the java programming classes austin brings that up um the best java programmers played a lot of Minecraft usually. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting. Thing. All right. Well, I have to actually jump on another conference call. So well, thank uh, you thanks so for much. having me. You guys, yeah. thanks. And we appreciate your time. And, uh, yeah. We'll post this to others if you don't mind, if we're, if it's okay, if yeah, we it's fine. post the video for others to yeah. see, because we have a few that have had trouble connecting. I'm getting messages. So anybody want to say bye though? Show it. Yeah. Me. Um, yeah, if anybody ever wants to reach out to me or anything, I'll, I'll, um, I'll post my uh, my website in here. There you go. Yeah. There you go. There you guys. All right. Okay. All right. Good one, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know the Zoom sessions are kind of awkward, but we're getting used oh, to it. That's it. good. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Have so a good one, guys. Right. Sounds good. See ya. Bye. I'll let you guys get out of there. I'm going to keep the rest of you. Okay. Yeah, that'll be awesome. I'm going to pause this.